Okay. Good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to BC213, the course on the end times. Thank you for connecting to the class today. We're going to pray. And then we're going to get started. Oops. Sorry, I just moved my computer. <clears throat> Let's pray. And uh, then we'll start. May I request somebody to please uh, pray with the class? And then we will start. Anybody, please uh, unmute your mic and pray. Who wants to pray? Pastor, can I pray? Please go ahead, Shakuma. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful morning. We thank you, Father, for your divine grace and strength of Father God. Lord, we ask you wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to receive your word and revelation so that it can edify our inner man of Father God and it can increase our knowledge and understanding of Father. We surrender everything into your mighty hand and we pray that, Father, Lord, as your servant is going to release your word of God, strengthen him with your wisdom and knowledge and with, fill him with your revelation, oh Father. I thank you and praise you and prepare each one of our heart so that we can able to receive this word as a seed, as a Lord Master, as, 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 a, as, a, as a spiritual food. We should strengthen us, O oh Father. Prepare us, O oh Father. We humble ourselves before your presence. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Kumar. And everyone, good morning. Welcome once again to BC 213, The End Times. So we are um, looking or we have been looking uh, uh, at a panoramic view or a, in a high level view on the sequence of events. And uh, last week we went through six reasons as to why we believe in a, sorry, in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That means the rapture of the church has to take place first before uh, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition is revealed to the earth. And then the seven years of tribulation will begin to unfold on the earth. So uh, we did that. I'm going to quickly review um, that part. And then we are going to proceed into looking at the sequence of events and um, uh, we will begin to do that. Right. And so um, if you have any questions, we will uh, keep time towards the end of each lecture uh, to take up our related questions. So here we are. Let me get rid of this. Don't need this. Um, we are looking at, um, you know, we went through this last week on why we say there's a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Uh, we looked at Second Thessalonians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul says uh, that though he who restrains has to be taken out of the way. And we uh, established that uh, the he has to be the church uh, because uh, the Holy Spirit is going to be continuing his work uh, among uh, those who become believers during the tribulation. Secondly, we talked about the promise to the church in, in, Thess in Thessalonica, or the believers at, this, uh, at Thessalonica, what the Apostle Paul wrote. Thirdly, we looked at the promise to the church in Revelation. Fourth, we looked at the typology that's used in Matthew 24, and Jesus talked about, uh, he, he made reference to Noah, the days of Noah, and the ark. And uh, we saw that as a clear illustration of uh, how things will unfold um, during the time of judgment and then uh, the saints being released back on earth. Number five, we said about the chronology of the book of Revelation, which is what we will be getting into today. And uh, if, we, if, we, if we look at the book of Revelation in a, in a very chronological way, the way it is written for us, we will see clearly that um, the church is taken out of the way before the seven years of tribulation. Number six, we mentioned that Daniel's 70th week was clearly stated to be concerning uh, the people, uh, the Jewish people and the uh, city of Jerusalem. So the, 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 
the church is not there, the church is not the focus of that 70th week. Uh, church is taken out of the way and God unfolds uh, these things concerning uh, Jerusalem uh, and the people of Israel. So we, we went through the six main reasons. Of course, you could you know break things down further and list a number of reasons. Then we answered a few other questions, you know, who would be raised up at the time of the rapture? Uh, will we meet Old Testament saints? Um, will we be able to, you know, who will be taken up in the rapture? And will we recognize each other in heaven? And uh, so we went on up till that point. And uh, Daniel's 70th week, we have seen it in previous times. Basically, we are establishing that uh, the 70th week, uh, that that is a period of seven years, as mentioned in, in the book of Daniel. And also that this seven-year period uh, is uh, referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble and so on. So what we're going to do now is we've, we've, you know, we've come to this point. So the rapture of the church has taken place. And now we need to see what unfolds uh, in the rest uh, of, 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 of the time that follows. And to do this, we're just going to journey through the book of Revelation. And um, I just wanted to, you know, uh, show you this piece. Um, and then share, share this slide with you. Okay. So uh, this chart you've seen earlier, which is uh, in the same PDF. Um, now, there are many approaches to the book of understanding the book of Revelation. And in our third year, next year, uh, we will go through Revelation, the book of Revelation, verse by verse. But what we're going to do now is just um, to do an overview of the book of Revelation to understand the sequence of events. Now, when the Lord Jesus begins to speak to the Apostle John, he tells John, he says, I want you to write the things that you have seen, the things, this is in Revelation 1 and verse 19. So yeah, I would encourage all of us to uh, please have uh, our Bibles in front of us so that uh, as we do this, uh, it will be useful. So if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 1 and just follow, uh, uh, the things will be clear. In Revelation 1.19, uh, the Lord speaks to John and he says, John, uh, I want you to write about the things which you have seen, the things which, which are and the things which will take place after this. So the book of Revelation can be broken down into these three sections. Things which you have seen, that is Revelation chapter 1, where John has seen the risen Lord. Then he says, things which are, that is chapters 2 and 3, which refers to the seven churches that were there uh, at that time. And then he says, things which will take place, that is chapter 4 onwards, chapter four onwards, which are things that will take place. All right, so um, we break the book of Revelation down into these three portions. So if you will see here, Revelation chapters one, two, and three uh, deal with this part, meaning uh, things that John is seeing and things that happened at that time, the seven churches. Then Revelation four onwards are things which must take place. And, Revelation um, um, 4 and 5 talk about what happens in heaven right after the rapture of the church, and I will explain that. And then Revelation 5 through 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 15, is the seven years of tribulation uh, and up until the coming of Christ. Revelation chapter 19, verses 16 to 21, talk about what happens right here. Uh, at the Battle of Armageddon, Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 1 to 10, talk about this 1,000 years, the millennium. Then Revelation 20, 11 to 15, talk about what happens here at the Great White Throne Judgment. And then Revelation chapters 21 and 22, talk about the new heavens and the new earth. 
So basically, our approach to the book of Revelation is to just look at it in a very chronological way, in a very sequential way. Now, um, uh, I'm just going to stop sharing and uh, just pretend I am in the class. Okay. So the, the there are different approaches um, in the in the study of the book of Revelation. And there are many different approaches. Um, and uh, so if you, if you look around, whether you read online or you read different scholars and others, people take different uh, presentations. You know, some, for instance, may say that the book of Revelation was fulfilled right there from AD 30 to AD 70. It all was fulfilled. Uh, and the, that's one of their positions. Uh, but then obviously, uh, John wrote the book of Revelation 1895. Uh, which you know, which was actually happened, uh, which was written later. So that's kind of a, a absurd position to take. Uh, then there are there are others who may uh, look at Revelation as more of a, like we said in the very introduction to this course, uh, they look at it uh, just you know uh, very allegorically. That's not okay. That's not going to happen literally but uh, things have been happening or the fulfillment of revelation has happened. We are now in the millennium and through the church, the reign of Jesus is taking place and all that. So there are different presentations, but we are taking, as I mentioned at the very beginning in the introduction, a very traditional presentation of the book of revelation. That is just follow it literally the way Jesus gave it. Things that you have seen, things that are, and things that will take place. So I'm going to go through the book of Revelation as an overview, not, uh, you know, not verse by verse. But as we go to the book of Revelation, it's actually giving us a sequential chronological unfolding of events. And so it will help us understand uh, how uh, things are taking place. And like I said, in the third year, we'll read it verse by verse and go through it in, in, in a greater depth. Now, just quick background to the book of Revelation. This was written. Uh, uh, okay, so I see Devia's question. Could you please explain the chronology of Revelation once again? All right, so uh, this is based on Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Okay, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, the Lord Jesus tells John, write the things that you have seen. So what has he seen in Revelation 1? He has seen the risen Lord. So write that down. And the things that are, what were the things existing? That is chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches. And things which will take place. That is chapters 4 till the end. So broadly speaking, the book of Revelation is divided into these three parts. Revelation chapter 1, the things you have seen. Chapters 2 and 3, things that are. Chapters 4 to 22, things that will take place. Okay. And then uh, as we get into the sequence of events from chapter 4, I will explain to you. Chapter 4 and 5 are giving a picture of the raptured church in heaven. Chapter 6 to chapter 19 are things that are taking place on the earth during Revelation, uh, during the tribulation. End of chapter 19 is the battle of Armageddon. Chapter 20, the first 10 verses, are the millennial reign, the thousand year reign. End of chapter 20 is a great white throne judgment. Chapters 21 and 22 are the new heavens and the new earth. So that's, we, we, I will explain that once again as we go through the book of Revelation. So our approach is a very traditional approach. That means take the Bible literally the way it's given. Don't mix it, uh, don't you know jumble it up. No, the way the Lord gave it, take it that way, sequentially, chronologically. And actually it's a very simple way to understand the book of Revelation. Uh, some people, you know, chop 
parts of it here and there, and you know, you'll find it people doing all kinds of things, uh, which make it very confusing. And I would say, I mean, it's up to you, of course, but I would say avoid all of that. Just follow what Jesus said, Revelation 119. This is what he gave. This is the way we will read it. Okay. So are you already uh, with me uh, to journey through the book of Revelation? Any questions before we start? Okay, you're ready. All right, so we're just going to go through the book of Revelation, you know, uh, sequentially. So a, a little background to the book of Revelation. Um, John, who was the, so the book of Revelation was written around AD 95, AD 95. So this means it is about 60 years after Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ, if his ministry was from AD 30 to AD 33, this is AD 95, 60 years approximately after the after Christ's ministry and the day of Pentecost, right? So the church has now been in existence for about 60, 60 years, 65 years, AD 95. The other thing that we must keep in mind is that by this time, all the other apostles are dead. Um, Peter and, you know, and the apostle Paul, they were killed around AD 68. AD 68, they were killed in Rome. And all the other apostles had, you know, were also subsequently or before or after they were all killed, martyred. But Paul, before he died, he had raised up the next generation of Christian leaders. You find it in Acts chapter 18, where he trained many young men in the city of Ephesus. So the city of Ephesus is, is a port city. It was, it's, 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 uh, it's, um, it was a port city on, on the more, if you look at modern day map, it was on the west coast of, of Turkey. So, or Turkey as a nation, they're changing their name. So, uh, but anyway, Turkey today is still called Turkey, but uh, on the west coast of Turkey is the city of Ephesus. And Paul spent three or uh, three years in the city of Ephesus on his third missionary journey. And uh, uh, he trained up the next generation of leaders, which included Timothy, Titus, and there are other names given in, in Acts, uh, Acts 18 or Acts 19. He mentions um, the names of these people uh, whom he had trained. So what happened after Paul, um, so, you know, this is in, uh, let me just give you, oh yeah, sorry, in Acts 20 and verse four, um, mentions the name of the other people other young men whom Paul trained, Acts 20, verse 4. So uh, Paul had trained the next generation of Christian young men, uh, whom, and it's very likely that from Ephesus, there were these other churches very close by to each other that were planted. So uh, Smyrna, uh, Pergamos, and uh, Thyatira, uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, were all cities very close to Ephesus on the west coast of Turkey. And they were all likely planted by people whom Paul the apostle had trained. And so Ephesus was like the mother church to these six other churches in that area. Now, subsequently what happened, um, Paul, you know, he went to Jerusalem, there he was arrested. So he spent two years uh, in, in uh, arrest in Caesarea, which is a port city on the west coast of uh, the land of Israel, he spent there. Then from there, he appealed to Caesar. And so he was sent by ship from Caesarea all the way to Rome. And he spent two years in Rome under house arrest. Uh, and then he was released for a little short time. And when he was released from Rome, he came to the island of Crete and he appointed Titus to be in charge of the church or the churches 
in Crete. And then he took Timothy and he appointed Timothy to be in charge of the church in Ephesus. And then he made his way back to Rome. And on his way back to Rome, he wrote the epistle to Titus. He wrote First Timothy. And finally, when he was in Rome, uh, he wrote Second Timothy, which was his last epistle. And right after that, he was killed. So Titus was in charge of the church or the churches in Crete, the island of Crete. Timothy was in charge of the church in Ephesus. And these were people who were trained by the Apostle Paul. So this was around AD 68. Paul, Peter, all dead by now. And so a new generation of leaders leading the church. But very sadly, in about 20 years from then, Timothy is no longer there. Titus, no longer there. And these churches that were started by the Apostle Paul or by people whom he had trained were now in a state of spiritual decline. And the only apostle left is John, who by this time is well into his 90s. So he's a very elderly person. And uh, the emperors had changed. So there was Emperor Nero, who was the emperor of Rome. He persecuted the Christians. He killed them. He burnt them alive. He threw them to the lions. And he's gone. There's a different emperor. This new emperor, his approach is different. He doesn't kill the people. He exiles them. He sends them away on exile. And so that's what he did. In order to get rid of John, the, the apostle, the last apostle, he sent him away in exile to the island of Patmos. The island of Patmos is just off the coast of Turkey, little, little into the agency. He sent him there. So let's let them not have any influence. So John is in the island of Patmos. This is 1895. John is very elderly. But while he's on the island of Patmos, he receives revelation. The Lord Jesus speaks to him. And, and really John is seeing, so John is, so, you know, Revelation 1.10, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So on a certain day, he's all by himself. He's caught up in the spirit. So his spirit is seeing all these things, hearing and seeing everything in the spiritual realm. His body is here on earth. And it is very likely that at the same time, he is writing down these things because the Lord said in Revelation 119, write the things that I'm showing you. So you can imagine in his spirit he is caught up into the heavens and he's hearing and seeing all these things. But in the body, he is recording everything he's saying. So he's writing what is being revealed to him. Okay, so that's how the book of Revelation is being given. Now, of course, the Lord said, I'm going to show you things which will take place. So the Lord is taking John literally thousands of years ahead into time. But John has only his context in which he's going to write these things. So, for example... If the Lord showed John a mobile phone. Okay, so John the Apostle, AD 95, he sees a mobile phone. How would he record it? He can only record it with the language and the context he has. So he will say, I see a black object. A voice comes out of it. It can sing. And, uh, you know, it can show, uh, you know, it, it, it has an eye that sees and takes, that shows the image of what it sees. It can speak, you know. So he won't call it a mobile phone. 
he won't call it, you know, an iPhone <laughs> or an Android phone. No, he's only going to describe it with the language that he has. But what is he actually saying? What is God showing him? God may be showing him. I'm just this example. Okay, I'm not saying God showed him a mobile phone. I'm just saying an example. So if God showed him a mobile phone, he's going to record it with language he has, with the context he has. Because God is showing him things which will take place, you know, literally thousands of years into the future. So keep that in mind that as we read, John was seeing things, but he was recording it with the language he had. One, that's one thing. Secondly, the Lord was intentionally using images or prophetic imagery to speak to John. So there are things that are, like we said, that will be taken literally the way it is. And then there are things that have to be interpreted as to what they mean. So how do we do, distinguish the two? Well, first of our first approach is that God shows him things literally. And if they can be understood literally, and if the literal makes sense, then we stay with it. And of course, the literal should be in harmony with the rest of scripture. But if the literal does not make sense, or if the literal contradicts the rest of scripture, then we have to say it is prophetic imagery. That means it is a figure. It is representative. It is an image that means something. So then we need to interpret it. So for example, if you start in chapter 1, John says, this is verse 4 and 5, he says, John to the seven churches. So yeah, seven churches, that's literal. There are seven churches. And we will see the names of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. So that's literal. And he says, grace to you and peace from him. So there are three froms in verses 4 and 5. There is from him who is, who was, who is to come. Then in verse 4, there is from the seven spirits, which are before the throne. And verse 5, from Jesus Christ. Now, the first from, we can understand. From him who is, who was, and who was to come. This is God the Father, the eternal God. The third from, we can understand. From Jesus Christ. But who is the second from? It says, from the seven spirits, which are before his throne. Now, seven spirits. What does that mean? Are there seven Holy Spirits? No. So that means seven spirits is not literal. It is figurative, representing the Holy Spirit, because there's God the Father, there's Jesus Christ. So therefore the seven spirits have to speak about the Holy Spirit. There's only one spirit. Ephesians 4, verse 4. One God, one spirit. So the seven spirits which are before the throne is figurative of the Holy Spirit. Seven represents the number of perfection in the Bible. So number seven in this case is figurative, symbolizing perfection. The perfect spirit. And the seven spirits you will find in chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. Um, he talks about, so the seven spirits, you will see that, now if you look in chapter chapter 4, uh, or, or um, yeah, um, chapter 
3 verse 1, he refers to the seven spirits of God. He who, chapter 3 verse 1, he who has the seven spirits of God. Sorry. Now the seven spirits of God is figurative of the one Holy Spirit. Because there are no seven spirits. One Holy Spirit. And then again, chapter 4 verse 5. It says, the seven lamps of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So, seven lamps representing seven spirits of God. Chapter 5, verse 6. Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. So, the Holy Spirit is represented by seven spirits of God. But here in verse Revelation 4, 5, seven lamps, seven horns, seven eyes, seven lamps, seven horns, seven eyes. And they're all referring to the seven spirits of God, meaning the Holy Spirit. So this is figurative. It cannot be taken literally. Why? Because it will contradict the rest of scripture. And there are some preachers who in the past have preached this and said there is there are seven Holy Spirits. That's not what it says because it will contradict the rest of scripture. So you cannot interpret it literally. You have to say it's figurative. So seven lamps of fire, what does it mean? Light. Light is pervasive talking about omnipresence seven horns horns in scripture represent power so seven perfect power that is omnipotence seven eyes eyes represent what you see knowledge seven eyes perfect knowledge omniscience so therefore we interpret it that way seven lambs represent representing omnipresence, seven horns representing omnipotence, seven eyes representing omniscience. All of these are images of the seven spirits of God or the Holy Spirit or the perfect spirit of God. So in this case, number seven is used figuratively. Whereas when he talks about seven churches, there it is literal. There were seven literal churches to whom the letter is, the first part of the letter is addressed. Okay. Whereas in the case of the seven spirits of God, and I'm repeating, I see Hope's request there. In the case of the seven spirits of God, it has to be figurative because there are no seven Holy Spirits. There's only one Holy Spirit. So seven spirits, that is Revelation chapter one, verse four, Revelation chapter 3 verse 1, uh, Revelation chapter 4 verse 5, and Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. In all of these cases, right? So these, these have to represent the one Holy Spirit. Yeah, and I see Felix's um, comment there, uh, Isaiah 11 to there. That's, that's, thanks for sharing that. So how can you understand this? Well, when you, the word num, the number seven represents perfection. Now, when you think about a beam of light, and I, I, and, and, and I use this illustration because it's very nice. You think of a beam of light, it comes through a prism and there are seven colors. But it's a single beam of light, but there are seven colors. So Isaiah 11, two talks about the seven fold, seven facets of the Holy Spirit. And these are not everything, but uh, yeah, so I'm explaining Isaiah 11 too, right? So there are seven facets of the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit of the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Adonai, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of Understanding, the Spirit of Counsel, the Spirit of Knowledge, the Spirit of Might, and the Spirit of the Fear of the Lord. Seven facets. So it's a, like that one beam of light that has seven colors. You know, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. But it's light one beam of light. So one Holy Spirit 
seven facets, seven expressions, but they're all combined in the one person of the Holy Spirit. So that's why seven spirits is used figuratively to talk about the one Holy Spirit. And Isaiah 11 too gives us the seven facets of the Holy Spirit, right? But he's one Holy Spirit. You all with me? So, the number seven, in some cases, has to be taken literally, and he talks about to the seven churches. But in some cases, it has to be taken figuratively, seven spirits. Okay? So, as John begins to have his revelation, chapter one, he sees the Lord, and he sees the Lord walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands, or he says here, uh, uh, in Revelation 1 and verse 12, he sees seven golden lampstands. So the lampstand is, uh, you know, what was used in the old tabernacle in the Old Testament. So each lampstand uh, had se seven uh, uh, limbs on which were the lamps. So it was really like a, uh, uh, it had seven limbs to so each lampstand. So there were seven lampstands. And he sees the Lord who walks in the midst of the seven lampstands. And in his right hand, he has seven stars. This is Revelation 1 verse 16. And he explains this in Revelation 1 20. He says, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So here you have these images explained for us. He sees the Lord, the risen Lord. He has seven stars in his hand. Again, this is just representa representation. The seven stars are the messengers of each of the seven churches he's going to speak to his right hand. And he sees Jesus in the midst of the seven lampstands. Each lampstand represents one of those seven churches. And there's only representation, meaning, keep in mind that at that time, there were hundreds of churches. So there was a church in Jerusalem, there was a church in Antioch, and there were many hundreds of churches all around. So there's only a representation, meaning, the Lord has the stars in his hand and he is seated or he is walking amongst his churches. The lampstands are representing the churches. The stars are representing the messengers. Now, who are the messengers? So the word messenger is the Greek word angelo, angelos. And the word angelos is used to refer to angelic beings, but it's also used to refer to human messengers. So in this case, he's referring to the human messenger, the person who is in charge of each of the seven churches, because he cannot be telling the angel or an angelic being, and he's not gonna hold an angelic being responsible for what's happening in the local church. And the angelic being is not, going, is not going to go and set things in order in the local church. So obviously, given the context, the messengers are referring to the spiritual leaders, leader in each of the seven churches. So each star is representing the leader of each one of the seven churches. But keep in mind, it's only, re only representation because there are hundreds of churches already by that time. So it's telling us that the leaders of the churches are in the hands of the Lord. And the Lord is moving among the churches. He is observing, examining, and seeing what is happening in each of those churches. Okay. Are you all with me so far? 
I'm going to take um, Sri Kumar's question. Uh, we will get into these details once again uh, when we go you know next year i'm just giving you an overview next year we will go slowly read verse by verse right i'm just giving a quick overview for you to you know for us to get into chapters uh, four onwards shikma please ask your question uh, thank you pastor pastor in that case i just want to know this seven stars is referring to seven real pastors or uh, mm -hmm. is it generic a uh, term is used like uh, as you said because there are a lot of churches were there so when it is um, uh, seven stars is it a generic term or uh, is it um uh, is it actually for a special per people or sorry special person is it that's what i want to know mm -hmm. so each star represents an actual pastor or leader of that church so what i was saying was uh, Jesus is saying, you know, I have seven stars, but literally uh, you could say he has hundreds of stars or maybe thousands or today it'll be thousands of stars because he holds the leader of every local church in his hand, meaning he's holding them responsible. Yes, of course, he's protecting them, but he's also holding them responsible. Okay, so this is figurative, he's telling us, look, I've got, so each one of the stars represents the messenger of each one of those churches. Because in chapter two, he says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? That means I'm speaking to the leader of that church and this is my message to him. And he is responsible for what's happening in that church. So each star represents the messenger of that church, the leader of that church. So in that case, uh, the church is in Ephesus and all the pastors of the Ephesus is responsible. He's speaking to, to all He's, the church. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. He's speaking to the leader, spiritual leader of each church. That particular area, all the churches. In, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. So verse 20, Revelation one twenty, he explains. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches or the messenger of each one of those seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Revelation 1.20. But what I want you to keep in mind is there are actually, by that time, there were hundreds of churches. So you may ask the question, what about all the other churches? No. This is only a representation. This is the Lord showing us that the leader of every church is in his hand, is represented by the star, is holding them responsible. And every church is before him and he's observing and seeing what's going on. So if you look at it in today's terms, there today there are hundreds of thousands of churches all over the world. Um, same thing. He's watching and observing all of them and every spiritual leader is holding them accountable. So now when we get into chapter two and three, the Lord has a message for each one of the seven churches. Okay. I'm not going into the detail of every message, which we will study, you know, later on. But if you want to just summarize, out of these seven churches, to six of them, he tells them repent. There's only one church he doesn't tell them to repent. That's the church in Philadelphia, which is in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. That's the only church that seems to have everything going well. And very interestingly, it is the only church, Revelation 3, verse 7, the church in Philadelphia, to whom he says that the opposing people will come and bow down. You know, in Revelation 3, verse 7, he says, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, verse 9, Revelation 3, 9, to the church in Philadelphia, he says, there is a synagogue of Satan and I will make them come and worship at your feet. That's the only church to whom he does not have a message of repentance. And it's the only church to whom he says, your enemies will come and bow at your feet. To the other six churches, there is a message of repentance. And if you look at what he you know, he tells them repent in 
happen. And we will actually be studying this uh, even in our course on holiness when we talk about repentance. Very quickly, to the church in Ephesians, he says, repent because they have left their first love. To the next, to, to the, next, uh, to the church in uh, uh, Smyrna, he says, repent because they are tolerating wrong doctrine. There is the, they were letting wrong doctrine go on in the church. And uh, the, the wrong doctrine which they were to tolerating. This is Revelation. Um, sorry, um, uh, sorry. This this is not the church of Smyrna, but this is the church in. Uh, okay, I need to correct myself. Um, only two two churches. That is the church in Smyrna, and the church in Philadelphia. It doesn't say repent. Right? The church in Smyrna is being persecuted. Uh, he doesn't tell them repent, but to all the other churches, that is five out of the seven churches, he says repent. Um, to uh, to the church in Smyrna, he says, do not fear. Okay, do not fear. To the church in Philadelphia, to that church, his only church, he says, your enemies will come and bow at your feet. Um, I was just going through the repentance messages. I'll just quickly go through it. So the church in Pergamos, he tells them they need to repent because they were tolerating wrong doctrine in the church. And this wrong doctrine was causing people just to go into sin. Same thing to the church in Thyatira. They were tolerating a false teacher and a false prophetess. And she was teaching people. And of course, it was wrong doctrine. And this again was causing people to go into sin. So both cases, wrong doctrine, wrong teaching, repent. To the church in Sardis, this is chapter 3, verse 1. He says, their works were not perfect before God, so repent. And to the church in Laodicea, they felt that everything is fine and okay, and things were not okay, so he tells them, you need to repent, right? So, uh, you know, we will look at all of these things in detail next year. Today we're giving an overview. So chapter 2 and 3 are a message to each one of those seven churches. And these seven churches existed right then. And it is very likely that John the Apostle was overseeing or had some spiritual influence in all of these seven churches because all the other apostles had died, they'd gone. And only John the beloved apostle was there. And so through him, the Lord is giving a message to these seven churches. But there's a lot that we can take away from studying each one of these messages for us, uh, you know, and uh, lessons to learn. But I think the, the, the main point that we take away is the Lord is watching everything that is happening in each and every local church. He's watching. He is evaluating. He is assessing everything that's going on in each and every local church. And he holds the spiritual leadership in each local church responsible for what is going on in each one of those churches. Okay, so we can take those lessons. I see Hope's comment, the Church of Sardis, yes. You know, their works were not perfect before God. So we can study what he said to the Church of Sardis and take that. You know, in fact, we should take away a message from each one of those seven churches, learn those lessons and make sure we don't fall into the same mistakes uh, or, you know, uh, you know try to, to learn from what he spoke to each one of the seven churches. Okay, so... Um, Christopher, your question, please. Uh, yes, Pastor, this is, uh, uh, this is in relation to maybe something you had, uh, uh, you know, you had talked a little earlier, um, these two questions. So I just wanted to, uh, I mean, the first question is really during the uh, transfiguration of Jesus when he was on the earth. Uh, and when you know he was Jesus was with uh, Elijah and Moses, uh, it seemed that they were recognized by the apostles Peter, James, and John. And uh, so, just my question is: uh, so had Elijah and Moses already attained um, glorified bodies, 
uh, that is before the rapture that is to take place, uh, you know, many years uh, afterwards. And um, that is the first question. And the second question is, um, um, I think you had mentioned that one of the uh, signs um, of, of, the, of the coming of the rapture is when Jesus is coming back to a glorious and, and united church. And at present, there seems to be quite a lot of division, uh, a lot of deceptions. Uh, so I just wanted to understand, um, would there be a need to have a great revival uh, you know, to take place to move this, move the, you know, the current uh, situation in churches to become glorious and, and united, which would then be a sure sign of the of the imminent um, second coming of of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, All right. So uh, the first question, uh, Matthew seventeen, uh, in the transfiguration of Jesus, um, what we refer to as the transfiguration. What is actually happening is Jesus is giving a preview of what he would be like in the kingdom or he, he would be like when he entered his kingdom. So that's why he tells uh, his disciples, some of you will see the son of man as he, he comes in his glory. So obviously, that doesn't mean, you know, that Peter, James, and John were going to live, uh, you know, for 2,000 years and wait till Christ comes. No. What was he referring to? He was referring to the Mount of Transfiguration, where they would see him get a preview of what he would look like in his glorified state. So what happened in the Mount of Transfiguration was a preview. So Jesus, and so also Moses and Elijah, at that time Moses and Elijah, you know, were, were dead, but the spirits were with God. Uh, sorry, at that time they were dead, and Christ had not yet resurrected, so they were, their spirits were held in paradise. But God brought them up and gave a preview to Peter, James, and John of how they would the Lord and Moses and Elijah would look in glory, right? So, uh, and I can just give just tell give you the specific reference that I'm mentioning. Um, uh, in Matthew sixteen twenty eight, it's twenty seven and twenty eight. Matthew chapter sixteen twenty seven twenty eight. Jesus says, "The Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father." And he says in verse 28, there are some standing here, Matthew 16, 28. They won't die till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now think about it. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, look, one of you, some of you, my apostles, you're not going to die until you see me coming in my kingdom. Now, obviously, they didn't understand what he was talking about. But this is Matthew 17, the very next chapter, is when Peter, James, and John see him how as he would be in his coming kingdom. Did you get it, right? So it's like a preview. And Peter, James, and John were the ones he was referring to in Matthew 16, 28. They are the three who got to see him as he would be in his when he comes in the glory of his father in the coming kingdom. And then Moses and Elijah were there. So... The answer to your question is, it was a preview of things to come. The second part of your question, the second question is, answer is yes. Uh, there will be a great work that God will do in the church to bring it into a glorious state. Now, uh, we feel like, you know, how is that ever going to happen? But then we just have to look at church history. And we look back in time, you know, just as much as... Uh, about 500 years before, uh, the church was in a very bad shape, uh, what we refer to as the dark period of the church. But see what God has done, right? He's brought us to where we are, from being there without scripture to today where there's so much happening. And he's done it in just in a matter of a few hundred years. 
So the rest of the work and things are accelerating. So the rest of the work that he needs to do to bring the church into a glorious state, he will do it. Uh, there will be, of course, a great refining, purifying and bringing out the glorious church. Okay. So let's go for a break. Um, I hope um, you, everyone's following me. If you have any questions, please put it in the chat. We'll take a 10 minute break and we'll be back in 10 minutes. And I'm just kind of speeding things up so that we can pick up from chapter four. Okay, see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.